Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate from many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Uh, we are starting a new series today. Uh, it's our custom at the beginning of every year to try to do something that focuses our conversations on uh, refreshing us on who we are, what we're about, uh, what we're doing here, and our our angle for that this year is going to be through our values. Uh, so we're kind of we're at an intersection in this season because this week is the start of the season of Epiphany in the Christian calendar. Uh, I think Friday was the first day of Epiphany, and the day before that, the last day of the twelve days of Christmas. Um, Epiphany is a word for revelation. Um, Jesus being revealed or um, the epiphany of God, the revelation of God is Jesus. Um, and so we're intersecting our values with text from our women's lectionary, as we've talked about, uh, 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 with a, 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 a conversation between the two. Um, so today, our value is intimacy with God, which uh, our language for this is that Participation in the life of God as father or mother, son and spirit is our foundational practice. So participation in God's life, that's our, our foundational practice. Uh, as, we, as we get into our text today, which is in Isaiah, um, I'm curious just to check in with you um, about this value. Because part of what we'll do in this series of conversations is... Uh, some discernment together. Um, how do these values feel to us right now? Do they feel uh, representative of who we are? Uh, do they feel more aspirational? Um, how, are, how are we doing in light of these values? How do we, how, um, what do we think now about what's our perspective now on these values and if they really fit us? So as you think about this value of ours for intimacy with God, for, for closeness to God, for participating in God's life, in our lives. Um, what's the vibe of that value to you right now? To what degree does it resonate with you or not personally? Is it picking up, Ryan? Let me ask you to define intimacy with God. Yeah, so um, intimacy is a word that means inmost or innermost or deepest. Uh, it is, it's a relational word that implies like a deep connection or like knowing the innermost parts of another person, um, knowing a person deeply or well. So intimacy with God would be knowing God well. Um, having a, a close relationship with God, having alignment with God and who God is. Uh, it is, um, it's participating in the life of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's being a part of who God is and what God is up to in the world. What's the vibe of this value to you right now? To what degree does it resonate with you or not, personally? Um, 
I personally don't feel like I have intimacy with God. It, um, I think we're just showing up in the same spaces. Hmm. Is there something to be said for that? Yeah. Yeah. So like, we're not hanging out. We're both here. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Thank you for sharing. But that's not one of those things that um um I don't know why a roller coaster came to mind, but, but you know how it is goes up real high and then it comes down kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, I used to think when I was younger that at this age, um I guess I kind of thought I was going to have arrived or something, you know, I've lived my life and I'm at this age and, and there are times that honestly, I feel like I'm starting right all over again. Um, and, and what does that look like? You know, what exactly does that look like for me? Um, and I, I think it may depend on the year or the time of season or whatever. Um, because I think I'm right with you as as right right now I'm not too sure what that looks like for me mm. um I've I've been doing a lot of reading the last part of this year and kind of almost longing for that again I know I've had it but I feel like somewhere along the way I've kind of lost some of it mm. that's just me I probably haven't but I feel like I have mm. um and so I'm really kind of doing some soul searching right now and asking myself, what does that look like? And I don't think it's always sitting down and having quiet time. Sure. I mean, that's what we've always thought it was. Yeah. But I don't think it's that. Yep. So. Thank you, Terry. It's on. Okay. Um, I struggle with, with the, the concept itself at times because intimacy as terry mentioned has often been equated with do you have your quiet time or are you doing that but i, mm. I see intimate and, and we've always contrasted it to uh activism but yet i see there is a, a rhythm to that intimacy and activism mm -hmm. it's not either or we're supposed to be it's supposed to be integrated somehow mm -hmm. some way um, as a community, and I feel awkward in even commenting as a community since I've been so gone so often, uh, I do think that there is the uh, rhythms that we have created in, in being in the presence of God. I, I was talking to uh, Marina, uh, or I was, we were passing recordings on to each other, and she spoke of how she had... Uh, this Christmas in the last few days has been in at the Orthodox Church and she said walking and I think I could share this she said walking in um it was the idea of suddenly she was overwhelmed she meant to talk to pray but she heard a choir singing and uh, she smelled the smells and suddenly she felt like I'm here I I don't have any words mm -hmm. you know um but yet her presence was a prayer mm -hmm. in that sense. And, uh, and so I think we have a rhythm of encountering presence of God that's more intentional mm -hmm. through our Sunday gatherings, which we talk about intimacy. Intimacy often is not, am I always talking or am I always hearing you say something, but intimacy can be just totally just being with someone in their presence and, I think you were kind of mentioning that in a sense that you're just there. Mm. Um, you arrived there, not not like you've made mm -hmm. it, but that you you've arrived in His presence, and you're just in that comfortable relational silence with each other. So I see that, mm. uh, and I think that we're as a community we're moving in those directions. Um, but then I, I just want to say, you know it's it's more than that isn't it? Mm. it it is that advocacy because the more i'm involved in his work the more i'm becoming intimate with him through that work yeah 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 so, I don't know if that, that's good Darryl. stream of conscious all of you are you're uh you're foreshadowing in your comments i mean i'm not going to need to preach because you're you're 
preaching for me. <laughs> Tom, Tommy and John and Ben, thank you for your use of the microphone. <laughs> um, it was probably a few months ago. I don't even think I told Daryl this, but I was just kind of doing some reflecting. And, you know, I think sometimes when we think about intimacy with God or whatever, I was thinking on the fact of like mine and Daryl's relationship. And it, it, you know, it's the, <laughs> any, anyone that's married, they know, understand that it's that ebb and flow sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's that, you know, there are some times that I feel closer to Daryl than I feel at other times and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And, and so I think that's, and I kind of, I kind of thought about that where God was concerned too, mm -hmm. because there have been times that I felt so connected to God and so right there with him. And there's been other times I'm like, who moved me or God? You know, I know who moved. Um, but I think it's a, it, it felt, it felt more real to me when I thought about that in the respect that I think that it's the same thing with God is, is that sometimes I feel closer to Daryl than I feel than I have at other times. And I feel the same way about that with God too, yep. is that's, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Cause I was kind of looking at my relationship and with God. And I was like, there's just, sometimes it's there and there's sometimes it's not. And yet I kind of equated that with feeling the same way about Daryl sometimes. And so that relationship. Yep. Yeah. It's a relationship. Um, that is, those are normal dynamics for relationships. Uh, Victor Turner is a British, was a British anthropologist who studied African tribes and their rites of passage. And um, one, of, one of his studies in particular studied the rite of passage of, of boys on the cusp of manhood. And um, the rites of passage uh, tribally to when they were at that moment where they were ready to become men, there was a there was a definite moment for the tribe to um, uh, create a moment that marked their transition into manhood. And the way that it would look uh, is uh, the tribe, when they identify a group of men or young young boys who are ready to become men, they would send them. Uh, out into the wilderness, uh, it, it essentially expel them from the tribe. And uh, this is this is Africa. So they're, they're, they'd expel them from the tribe. Okay, you guys are on your own now. Uh, good luck, essentially. They were left to fend for themselves, to, um, to protect themselves from the wildlife, to gather food, uh, to to survive, to be to, to get along well enough to be together, they they were completely removed from the structures, from the hierarchies, from the customs, from um, the values and the status that they experienced in their tribe, and and cast out into the wilderness to kind of sort it out. And one thing that he observed uh, that that occurred in the, this. Uh, this group of, of young boys becoming men in the wilderness was a dynamic among them where the, uh, the playing field was leveled uh, and their, their relationships took on a different state because of their shared experience together. Um, and he called that dynamic communitas. Um, it, it was the, uh, the sense of relationship that's formed through this shared experience in the wilderness, through this transition point. And the, the, the key ingredient in that experience of communitas for these young men was this idea of liminality. That's the, the second and final big word that I'll use. Um, liminality is essentially the sense of like being in between. Um, it, to be in the wilderness, to be outside of their tribe, was for them to be in between boyhood and manhood. When they came back, everything was going to be different. They would be men. Now, they would have a different social status in their tribe. So this was, this was the liminal space. It was the in-between. I'll, I'll explain it, Siri. <laughs> if, it, if one room is the past and another room is the future, 
then the threshold between those rooms is liminality. You're, you're st what's that? Oh, Siri, hush. Uh, uh, I, I made the mistake of saying her name. I'm so sorry. Uh, so to stand in between those rooms on the threshold, that is liminal space. It's to be neither in the past or in the future, but in between. So it was, it was the liminality that this group of young boys experienced together that forged something in them. They were on their way to something together. And it, you know, it's, it's akin to uh, like a band of brothers kind of uh, idea, like soldiers going off to war. They experience something really terrible and awful together. And there's a bond that's forged between them uh, and between those who survive, really. Um, or uh, maybe like Frodo and Samwise and uh, is it Pip and yeah, the fellowship when they get back and they're sitting in the Shire having beers at the end of the movie and they just they have all of this experience behind them now of this this story that they've lived together that that was that was a liminal experience they were they were in between the world that was before Mordor and Sauron and all of that. Uh, and the world that was to come on the other side of that when the ring was destroyed. Sorry if you haven't watched the movies yet. That's, <laughs> that's what happens. A lot of spoiling today. Uh, uh, married couples. Terry, Daryl, y'all were talking about marriage. Married couples experience this. I, Julie and I experienced this. Maybe you experienced this. When, uh, when you're married, my grandfather would say, you leave and you cleave. So you leave your family and you cleave or connect to your spouse. Um, it, it's uh, an, a translation of Genesis one, I think. You know that sure is. So, so the idea being, um, you leave your family, you you go out into the wilderness, as it were, and you you survive together. Uh, you get your first apartment. You know, you were talking about Alyssa and Michael. You know, they're trying to get their jobs, trying to get established. And couples will look back on that time with some nostalgia and say, oh, those were those were hard times, but those were good times. Like we learned to really depend on each other. We couldn't depend on our immediate family in the same way. That is a sense of communitas that's created in that liminal space of marriage. It's the same dynamic going on in these tribal rites of passage. Pause. Isaiah, in our text today, um, receives a vision from God in a time when Israel had lost its way. Um, Israel, the people of God, they received the, the law of God. They were rescued by God from Egypt. Uh, they were liberated, but they became oppressors themselves. They were unjust. They were violent. Um, they were harsh to those who were vulnerable, to the widows and the orphans. They were selfish. They were idolatrous. They um, were trying to manipulate their local deities to uh, accomplish their own will for them. Uh, Dr. Wilda Gaffney observes that the house of Jacob is also actually the, another name for Israel, the house of Leah and Bilhah and Zilpah and Rachel. It was a family built through the forced impregnation of enslaved women. So Israel's got some stuff going on. It's got it's got some some uh, uh, some bad, unhealthy uh, impulses and DNA in the midst of it. It uh, it's a it's a picture of injustice. And in the midst of that context, Isaiah sees this vision of Jerusalem and the temple in Zion uh, like a mountain. And Jerusalem was already higher than other places in Palestine. Anywhere in Palestine, if you're going to Jerusalem, you're going up. Um, you're, going, you're going up to the Temple Mount where the temple was, where God was worshipped. And he sees this picture of Jerusalem like the mountain is growing and it grows and grows and grows and gets really high. And the temple is up there with God. It's, it, it's as if everybody could be able to see it. Now it was elevated above uh, other mountains as if to say, this is really, this is the center. This is 
the most important place. This is the most important person. And he sees nations, people from all over starting to stream. They start to river to the mountain, to climb the mountain, to be with God, where because God for Israel lives on this mountain, and then he dwells in the temple on this mountain. And he sees all these people come, and they sit at God's feet, and they learn from God, they learn Torah from God, um, and they walk in God's ways. And the result is that from this experience of the nations rivering to this mountain of God and learning from God and walking in God's ways, that there's an end to violence. There's no more invasion of big global powers into other countries for their own purposes. There's no, there's no more warcraft and training for war. And, and more than that, there's, there is um, creativity and cultivation now. The language of the story is that uh, uh, folks uh, like Shane, Shane Claiborne does, they took their guns and they melted them down and they turned them into shovels. And they, they took their spears and they melted them down and they turned them into plows. And they, they took uh, their other tools and, uh, of war and they melted them down and they turned them into other things that could cultivate the earth. They, they, they turned these tools of devastation into tools of cultivation because they had learned something and connected with God in that way. So if that's the destiny for all the nations to come close to God, learn God's ways, build this flourishing world together, then I, in Isaiah's mind, Israel needs to live into that destiny. Israel was supposed to be the forerunner of that destiny. Oh, house of Jacob, this little section ends. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let's go to the mountain too. We're supposed to be there already. Let, let's remember who we are. Um, it's striking to, to the comments that were made about intimacy with God. It's striking that the nations and Israel come close to God in this vision, not through some mystical union of contemplative prayer and quiet time together with the Lord, but by learning and doing, learning God's ways of love, peace, justice, righteousness, and walking on that path, doing those things, building a world on those ways, a world where everyone belongs, putting down the tools of devastation and destruction and picking up the tools of cultivation and creation. Uh, humanity doesn't just become of one mind and one heart with God. Humanity, the, the many peoples, the nations become of one hand with God. They share in the things that God does. This vision imagines a rite of passage of sorts, the world's rite of passage with God into flourishing. And in this liminality and the in-betweenness, the transition period from the old world to the new world, when the nations learn God's way, God governs with justice and the nations live justly, that shared experience brings a sense of communitas, not, not just between the nations and Israel that come to God, but between God and humanity, a sense of connection and intimacy in the shared pursuit of God's ways, God walking alongside of humanity. Uh, as I considered using this frame of communitas for intimacy with God, uh, it felt a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Uh, uh, because to, to talk about communitas in our relationship with God, I mean, I've thought about it for us as a Christian community before, that when we go on mission together or whatever in our neighborhoods, like there's a bond that forms with us. But like to experience that with God, uh, part of communitas is this sense of leveling or equality. And is, does, does communitas press the envelope too much? Does it, does it erase the difference between us and God to say, yeah, we're all on the same page now. We're buddies with God. Um, felt a little uncomfortable. Does it collapse the difference? Um, does God become equal with humanity in this rite of passage? One of the tribes that Victor Turner observed was the Dimbu tribe of Zimbabwe. 
And they have this very interesting rite of passage for a new king uh, elect. So the, the new king to be had a rite of humiliation that he would go through as a part of his initiation into kinghood. Uh, the new elect king would become like a commoner. He would be stripped of all of his rights and privileges. He wouldn't have any, he wouldn't have his royal entourage or whatever customs and protections and privileges and resources that he normally did. He would live right alongside of all of his people, just like everyone else, um, as if to say, "Don't forget that you're one of us, and don't forget that you're not becoming the king to lord it over us." You're becoming the king to be a servant uh, to your people. In today's story from Matthew, John the Baptist is out in the desert, liminal space, proclaiming this similar message to Isaiah that Israel needs to repent and live justly and prepare itself for God's arrival. Someone greater than John is coming after him, John says. And then Jesus goes to John and says, hey, would you baptize me? And John resists because, well, oh, I don't, you're the, you're the one that's greater coming after me. And, and wouldn't it be humiliating and inappropriate for me to baptize you? Shouldn't you baptize me? This seems out of order. But Jesus insists. And here is the epiphany of epiphany. Jesus is revealed as the son of God the beloved anointed one of God, the embodiment of God, the one come to rescue Israel, rescue the world. In the person of Jesus, Isaiah's vision takes an unexpected turn. Um, not only does Israel and the nations come to the mountain of God to learn from God and walk in his way, but God in Jesus descends the mountain, lowers himself, goes the distance himself to humanity. Jesus becomes one of us so that he can teach humanity his ways and walk with humanity in these ways. Jesus would later say to Israel, if you're exhausted, if you're tired, come to me. Um, my yoke is easy, as if Jesus were an oxen under a yoke, a double yoke, uh, an oxen pull the, the tools of cultivation in a world for its flourishing. And Jesus says, come and get under my yoke. I'll carry most of the weight. But we're, we're going to walk alongside of this together. We're going to do this together. Ah, I'll, I'll, I'll be your equal in this. I mean, I'll pull a little more weight. But I'll be your equal in this liminal space, this new world that we're building. Jesus descends into liminal space with Israel and forges communitas with them. He forges this, this closeness and connection in a shared experience of creation and cultivation of healing, and eating, and inclusion, and liberation. Willie Jennings, in his book, Christian Imagination, contends that some of the seeds of white supremacy and colonialism, the European takeover of as much of the world as it could take over, um, some of those seeds were sowed when European Christian folks started to identify themselves with Israel and replaced Israel with the church, or at least their white European expression of the church. So if, uh, um, if our white European church is Israel, um, uh, it, then Jesus can become white, and then we can spread our white European churchness all over the world. You can see that's colonialism. That's how, that's how it works. They forgot that they were Gentiles. They forgot that they were on the outside and not at the center. They forgot that they were included down the line and not from the beginning. They were the nations who came to the mountain of God and not the house of Jacob. And the same is true for us. We are not at first identified with Israel in Isaiah's story. We are first identified with the many nations that later get to come to the mountain of God to learn God's ways. We get grafted into the tree, as Paul would say. We're not first to the party. We're here on the good graces of God um, down the line. And part of what that means is that it's not our role 
to implement Isaiah's vision. Uh, we uh, to get the nations to come to the mountain of God. Like that's the impulse of colonialism. We've got to get everybody under our tent. We've got to get all the nations to come in and we can, we can make them all conform to a particular way of being. Um, that's not our role because we are the nations. <laughs> we should just focus on climbing that mountain, y'all. As in a good Texas spirit, yeah. Bad things happen when we presume to be the executors of Isaiah's vision. God is the executor. So our invitation, like Israel's, is to learn God's ways and to walk with God in God's path, to walk in the light of the Lord. That's what it means, to learn from God and to participate and partner with God, uh, to participate in God's nonviolent posture, to help cultivate and build a, wor a world with God where everyone belongs because God has descended the mountain so that we could belong. And as we do that, we have this sense of communitas, connection, closeness, intimacy with God, a sense of connection that emerges from this liminal space that we're in. Because we still, we live, we're in the wilderness with God. Our entire lives are a wilderness. They're the in-between, between what has come before and the new world that God has inaugurated in the person of Jesus, a world of peace and justice and flourishing, even amidst a world still filled with violence and war. All right, so I want to invite you to take a little bit of time. I'm going to give you, I don't know, a minute to yourself uh, to do some assessment um, and to think about this year and this value and what, what do you think you need to learn from God this year? If, if closeness to God is learning from God and doing with God. Um, what might you need to learn from God this year? Which of God's ways do you need to put into practice this year? Um, and as a side note, this, this assessment is not served with a subtle side of shame. You are already enough. You are already loved. Uh, this is only about you taking more, hold more of the good and beautiful life that God has created for you. And for those of us who are recovering from religious trauma and rebuilding our relationship with God, um, Isaiah's vision is really good news because it invites our whole bodies into, participate, uh, into participation with God. Um, when trauma gets stuck in our bodies, sometimes the only way to work it out is through action. And that's exactly the invitation to walk in the, the ways of God is exactly that. Um, Richard Rohr says, our healing is often found in our doing. Um, that connects to this question, which of God's ways do you need to put into practice this year? So let me give you a minute just to reflect. What do you need to learn from God this year? Or which of God's ways do you need to put into practice this year? Um, reflect on that, and then we'll conclude. And I'll, I'll bring us back to, I'll initiate the comeback together. Mm -hmm. What do you need to learn from God this year? Which of God's ways do you need to put into practice this year?
Okay, well, um, as we wrap up, I'm curious, is there, um, all, are, all are welcome, but none are required. Is there anything you're, uh, you're leaving behind or taking away today? Is there anything you're leaving behind or taking away today? There. Oh yeah, the clicker. I don't want to neglect anyone there. A um, couple of things hit me. One, and this hit me immediately from that very passage that you were reading um, in the message. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I mm. thought that just bit very and li lined up very much with what you're saying yeah. uh for me um the to leave behind is selfishness self-centeredness mm. for me personally um and to embrace and understand how i'm using this word to embrace hospitality and by hospitality i don't mean uh, having people into my house. We want to do that more, but that's not what I'm referencing. I'm referencing an individual hospitality toward people with whom I come in contact with to pay attention. Hmm. Those outside of my tribe, my faith, uh, outside of perhaps Christianity, uh, just to pay attention and offer a space for them to find safety in my presence, mm. which means I have to really be paying attention because I won't see them mm. if I don't. Yeah. So that's for me. I love it. Ryan, did you raise your hand back there? Do you have a comment to read? Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Um, so it's on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like, like for a while now, I've been in a, a liminal, I don't know, space. Mm. Um, and so I'm feeling like, like, <laughs> The only way you can start to know something is like to try and know something. <laughs> um, it doesn't just like ooze into you mm. as you're walking along. Yep. Um, uh, and so I, I think what I want to learn this year is what God is like and what God is for mm. and what God is against. Um, and so I think that means I need to actually be intentional about gleaning information. Like mm. I actually need to read. I actually, you know, like I actually have to search and, yeah. you know, acquire information Do some to digging. deduce. Yes. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. All right. Um, let me uh, let me pray for us as we uh, as we try to learn from God and walk in God's ways. God, thank you for descending the mountain uh, to become one of us. Thank you, Jesus, for coming alongside of us, for um, inviting us to, to walk with you and to work with you and to participate in your unforced rhythms of grace. Uh, I pray for my brothers and sisters, for myself, that you give us wisdom to respond to what you're putting in our hearts. Um, whether it's a posture of hospitality or, or learning more about who you are 
what you're for, what you're against. God, would you would you lead us forward by your Holy Spirit as we try to respond, as we try to learn from you and walk with you, um, and in doing so, to become close to you. Give us grace this year to do exactly that. In Jesus' name, amen.